Hello, my name is Matt. Uh, welcome to my first ever book review here on this channel. This is something I wanted to do uh, a long time ago. We're talking probably a couple of years at this point. Um, and I just haven't had the time. Uh, but my back has been killing me, so I'm taking some time off work for the first time in forever. I know that like some people, like their whole industries have shut down and you know, I'm, I'm very grateful that I've had work and income throughout this whole pandemic, but man, I have not had a period of slowdown at all and I am exhausted. Uh, but you know, like I said, so I'm, I'm going through like some physical issues with my back, but the silver lining here is I finally got time to sit down and record some material for you guys and start producing uh, book reviews, which I hope to do uh, with a great deal of consistency. Um, from this point forward. Um, uh, if you don't know who I am, um, I'll, you can get to know me at some other time. I really just kind of want to focus on the book that I have to talk to you about today because I've got a lot to say. Um, I'm new to BookTube. Uh, I'll have a video coming out where I explain a little bit about who I am, what I want this channel to be about, and about my rating system. Um, it'll come out either uh, it should come out the same day that, that this is coming, that um, I'm recording this. So if you're curious about, you know, all that kind of boring housekeeping stuff about how I run this channel, or even just a little bit about who I am and why you should care, uh, I, I don't know that I can actually provide you any of that. But, <laughs> you know, at any rate, that video will be coming shortly. Um, so for now, let's focus on uh, the first book that I'm going to be reviewing here on this channel, and that is A Boy and His Dog at the End of the World, by C. A. Fletcher. Okay, so let's talk about how I found this book, uh, or perhaps how it found me. You know, um, I live right around the corner from a locally owned used bookstore, I'm literally a stone's throw from where I live, and um, I don't get to go all that often because I work nights and uh, the place isn't open on the weekends. So uh, I'm usually asleep during its usual hours of business, but whenever I do get to go, it's such a treat. Um, and although I normally stock up on the always random and often quite weird and unique quirky assortment of used material that the place has to offer, it's an absolutely massive store uh, for the small town that I uh, live in. But they also have uh, a very tiny section devoted to selling a uh, new stock, um, including new copies of perennial bestsellers and, and old literary classics, and also recent releases. Um, a Boy and His Dog at the End of the World by C.A. Fletcher was one of the latter. Um, the book was released in 2019, in April. Um, actually, it was on my sister's birthday, in fact. Um, but I only picked it up um, a few months ago, earlier this year, um, when I was browsing around the store. Uh, the book's um, bright orange uh, cover art and that uh, sort of dark dog silhouette, uh, the contrast of that, the bright colors, um, just the, the look of the whole thing. Um, I found that really um, just kind of uh, eye-catching. Um, you know, the, the title also I liked. You know, it was sort of uh, sad and desolate um, and also somehow kind of warm and inviting. Um, and coming-of-age tales are absolutely some of my favorite types of stories, um, at least when they're done well. But for whatever reason, at the time that I picked up this book, um, I hadn't actually read one for a while. Um, and this is a post-apocalyptic um, story. So the idea of a coming-of-age story uh, set in a post-apocalyptic setting uh, looked quite promising um, and intriguing to me. Um, so I opened the book and discovered a curious little note from the author, and it said the following. All that and that was the wrong note. <laughs> It'd be a kindness to other readers, not to say this author, if the discoveries made as you follow Grizz's journey into the ruins of our world remained a bit of a secret between us. C.A. Fletcher. Ooh. I turned the page and found a wonderfully simple and ominous little epigraph. It said, a man stole my dog. I went after him. Bad things happened. I can never go home. Mm. I turned to the first chapter and found myself delighted by what I saw. Chapter 1. The End. Ooh. 
A little cheesy, a bit pulpy, a fun, tempting, flourishing touch. I proceeded to read the first page. I found myself really absorbed by the language, but I stopped just short of turning the page and actually ended up reading it through a second time. Uh, I can't really explain why, but something didn't feel quite right. Uh, I moved to a quiet corner of the store, and I read the page yet again, aloud this time, in my best attempt at a Scottish accent. Of all the animals that traveled the long road through the ages with us, dogs always walked closest. And those that remain are still with us now, here at the end of the world. And there may be no law left except what you make it, but if you steal my dog, you can at least expect me to come after you. If we're not loyal to the things we love, what's the point? That's like not having memory. That's when we stop being human. That's a kind of death, even if you keep breathing. I really can't explain why, but something about this seemed appropriate. Uh, I turned to the back of the book and read about the author. Pleased with myself for detecting implicit Scottishness, and by what I'd read on the first page, um, I pulled out my phone, googled the title, and found that the book had been positively reviewed by a relatively large amount of readers. I think there was over 10,000 um, reviews left on Goodreads of this book, um, most of which were high ratings. I had never heard of Mr. Fletcher before, but I decided to roll the dice on this one. Uh, I paid for it and a few other used books. Um, brought the lot home, and began to read. The more I read, the more I realized that this was probably the perfect first book for me to, to discuss on this channel. Um, it helps that I have a lot to say about this particular story, um, so this is going to be like a nice juicy discussion, I feel. Um, but there's also a Reader's Club questionnaire um, printed uh, at the end in the final pages of this book. Um, in which uh, a bunch of questions are asked um, as a way of uh, facilitating an after-reading discussion. And I think that most of the questions are very good ones. Um, they provide an excellent basis as a starting point for a discussion. Uh, I'll cover those talking points later um, to close the video out. Uh, but what I love about them and the answers that I've prepared um, to them is that I think it's a great icebreaker, not just as discussion for this book, but also between me and you, the viewer. Um, so if you don't know me at all, and if any of you who also read this book decide to answer the questions in the comment section, I'll get to learn a lot about you um, in the same way that you'll get to learn about me in turn. Um, but again, we'll come back to all to that later to close the video out. Uh, before I go any further, I do want to make this quite clear. I've got to say this. This is a story that I find absolutely impossible to talk about in a meaningful way without getting into serious spoilers. Um, so at the same time, I don't want to ruin the experience for any of you who might think that this is something you want to try. So I thought that a compromise to that will be, I will explain the book's basic premise here up front. I will cover some of the things I feel the author did well. Um, without giving anything away. Um, and when the time for spoilers comes, I'll be sure to give uh, a big, huge warning and time to click away if you need it. Okay, fair enough? Cool, let's get going. Okay, so like I said earlier, this is a post-apocalyptic setting. Um, I thought that I would first talk about the setting and establishment. I've written a bunch of uh, bullet points just so I don't leave out any of the important details and to prevent me um, from accidentally giving too much away up front here. Um, so uh, the setting, um, it, it was one where, uh, as I recall, an exact year um, uh, was never really given to us. Um, but it's anywhere from, say, 100 to 200 years um, at least uh, from our current times here. And things have gotten pretty grim. Um, in the wake of multiple mysterious 21st century cataclysms that are kept deliberately vague by the author, um, the world as we knew it has come to an end. Uh, this is pretty eerie as the book was published in early 2019, so the timing um, it probably helped uh, with the book's popularity. Um, as a result of um, an, uh, an event that's known only as the Gelding, 
um, most people cannot have children. Um, and that's been the case since like the world ended. That was the end of the world, sort of like it's it's described as a kind of soft apocalypse um, in which we as humanity just kind of petered out because only 0.0001% um, are capable of reproduction. Uh, this estimate means that out of some 7 billion people, only 7,000 or so were capable of having children. Uh, over the years, as people from our time aged and died off without successors, <clears throat> the human population declined very rapidly, very drastically. So not much is understood about how this affliction emerged, and for the purposes of the story, um, it, it really isn't important. What matters is the themes, the journey, the experience, the characters, right? So what is known um, is that humans are affected, of course, but also so were dogs. Um, fertility among both species is similarly rare. Um, and while the birth rate is obviously low for all, females are especially rare. Um, our protagonists, um, two dogs are one of each, a boy named Jip and a girl named Jess. Um, so Grizz is our main character, um, who lives with his family and his two dogs on a small island a short distance off the coast of what used to be Scotland. Uh, Grizz comes from a small community and has never met enough people in his life to fill out two opposing teams to play a game of um, football or soccer for my fellow Americans out there. Um, the island is abundant with land for foraging for food and for hunting rabbits, a lifestyle which has made Grizz into a skilled archer. There seem to be a lot of archers in end of the world tales <laughs> or dystopias. Um, but anyway, uh, occasionally um, Grizz and his family, uh, they, they need to travel around to um, the surrounding islands uh, using little paddle boats um, to search old dwellings and ruined towns um, for uh, additional supplies, um, uh, things like medicine, books, whatnot. Uh, they call this activity going a Viking, like we're going a Viking, right? And so on a neighboring island, there is another family um, named the Lewis men, um, consisting of a husband, his wife, and their four sons. Uh, we're told about these characters, but we never actually get to meet them. I'll come back to this point later during the spoiler segment. So uh, getting back to Grizz himself and his immediate family, uh, he has a mother and a father, as well as a sister named Bar and a brother named Ferg, um, who I think are supposed to be twins. I don't know that it's spelled out, but just judging from the way that he talks about them being seven years older than he is, if they're both seven years older, I'm assuming that they're twins. While an exact age for Grizz is never given, we're told of an incident that happened when he was eight. And uh, based on the time that's elapsed since then, um, from the best that I can recall, uh, I'd say he's got to be somewhere between the ages of 16 and 18 uh, during this actual story. Um, so the traumatic incident that I just referenced um, in question was the loss of a second sister. Um, a nine-year-old girl at the time named Joy, who died while trying to recover her lost kite. The tragedy was twofold, actually, because Grizz's mother sustained a terrible head injury while trying to rescue Joy. Um, as a result, mom can no longer function without help and cannot speak, um, though the family still finds comfort and recognition from her when they sit and talk to her and hold her hand, things like that, right? So the basic premise is that one day a traveler named Brand comes along. Uh, he is charismatic with a red beard. He has been to other countries using a larger boat, um, a sailboat with distinctive red sails. Um, and he comes bearing gifts and has wares for trade. Uh, one night, Brand passes around a jar of marmalade to Grizz and his family, who've never had the chance to try products made with citrus fruits before. Um, Grizz has a chipped tooth from an earlier adventure with his dogs, and so the sugar in the marmalade causes discomfort, um, so he only eats a little bit. Um, and because he doesn't consume so much of the sweet treat as the rest of the family, um, he's not affected by what happens, because it turns out that Brand uh, drugged them all with some additive that he mixed into the marmalade. Um, this leaves the family completely helpless while he steals Grizz's dog Jess and makes his escape, hoping to use her for breeding. Um, because, again, uh, uh, dogs, females, are so, are so rare. And since Grizz 
um, only had a tiny taste of the, the marmalade. He recovers first and springs into action with his other dog, Jip, on his heels, and he storms off after Brand to go rescue his dog. So that's the premise. Grizz must journey through what remains of the world, facing dangers of all sorts on his quest to track down the thief and rescue his stolen dog and watch over the one he still has by his side. So that's what the book is about. Okay, next up, I thought it was worth having a segment where I discuss just the formatting and general content and structure of this book, um, because it's a little bit different. Um, the book is written in first person and takes place entirely from Grizz's POV. Grizz is telling the story about his failed search for Jess um, from some unknown location in the present, hinting at the fact that some tragedy has occurred and that he can never return home to his family. Um, on some level, the book is itself a love letter to literature and a commentary about the importance of reading and the power of storytelling. Uh, most of what Grizz knows about the world he understands from information he got from books written in our time or even before. Unlike digital devices rendered useless by the ravages of time and the lack of power sources, the collapse of the internet, etc., uh, books tend to age gracefully and have been the only reliable window into the world before the apocalypse that Grizz has ever had, because again, that was generations ago, even his parents don't know anything about that. At least, not firsthand. If you'll forgive me, I'm reminded of a favorite quote of mine from an old episode of Gargoyles, a cartoon that I never quite managed to grow out of. Um, I am a 90s kid, by the way. Um, but the quote goes, uh, books are lighthouses erected in the dark sea of time. And it's just this wonderful sort of uh, notion that I've, I've never quite managed to stray far from in my mind. It's one of my all-time favorite sayings. And that idea is explored very elegantly and eloquently and powerfully um, throughout this narrative. Now, where Grizz's father is concerned, um, books are only useful if they're practical. Uh, he likes books that the family can put to use, things that, books that are about things like foraging, farming, medicine, first aid, things like that. Um, but Grizz has a soft spot for fiction. Um, allusions are made to well-known fantasy stories, like The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. Um, there are also direct references to novels um, that had a more obvious influence on Fletcher, um, clearly as a person and in the writing of, the, of this particular story. Um, these include A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter M. Miller Jr., uh, which is a work of sort of Catholic-inspired science fiction uh, set on an earth that has seen a devastating nuclear war. Um, it has sort of similar themes as well to Isaac Asimov's Foundation. Um, and also uh, Cormac McCarthy's The Road is also referenced directly in the text of um, this book. Um, but The Road, I thought, was a notable mention here as well because Fletcher's story is written with dialogue attribution but without quotation marks. So it's sort of like trying to seamlessly blend speech and with prose uh, or dialogue with prose um, and that is a feature um, of Cormac McCarthy's writing as well and it's also not something that I'm generally thrilled about as a reader myself um, however um, here I think it, it does kind of work it's not without merit for one thing there are vast stretches of time where Grizz is alone with only his dog Jip around so it's not like he's doing a lot of talking anyway um, and the thing that I actually do like about this style is that I feel that it doesn't really ever ask too much of the reader um, and their suspension of disbelief. Um, because it's sometimes difficult to imagine that when somebody is chronicling an event like this in like a first person um, narrative where they're talking about something they've been through, it's sometimes difficult to imagine that, that somebody could remember exactly word for word how our conversation proceeded with everybody that they've interacted with up to that point and with every situation that they're writing about. Um, so in that vein, it also opens the door to the question of whether Grizz is a reliable narrator. Um, if so, to what extent, and also whether the author intends him to be at all. I'll address those questions later during the spoiler section. Um, but as a final point about the lack of quotations, the seamless blend between the dialogue and the prose also allows the author to play with the phonetics of language um, after Grizz encounters somebody who doesn't speak English. Um, again, more on that later. Okay, so I thought I would give my sort of spoiler-free pros and cons section now. Um, so what I liked. Um, I liked the author's use of prose and beautiful reflections on the nature of life as expressed through the character of Grizz. Uh, there's a lot of commentary on nature, 
music and the importance of reading, as well as the contrast between the kind of world Grizz occupies and the one that we, the readers, reside in. Um, I really like the establishment of Grizz and his family, uh, as all these characters were given a decent amount of characterization, all things considered, with relatively little in the way of word count. Um, early on, Fletcher did an amazing job. Um, he did a great, he got a good amount of mileage out of each paragraph and provided relevant information, elegant prosaic reflection, and effective foreshadowing, all with a great deal of emotion and also efficiency and economy. Um, he did it very, very well. Uh, lastly, um, what I really loved was the true meaning of the title. Um, and this takes a little explaining. Uh, the framing device for the story is that Grizz is writing down his story while trapped somewhere in a hopeless situation. I've already mentioned that. Um, and he's telling the story to a boy he's never actually met uh, through just the desperation of having nobody else to write to. Um, one day while going a Viking with his family, uh, Grizz discovers a room which had served as somebody's hiding place long ago. Um, and Grizz calls this place the Chamber of Secrets. Uh, incidentally, um, no other ref references are made directly to either J.K. Rowling or the uh, Harry Potter brand by name, which I assume has to do with the ongoing controversy surrounding that author um, and the desire on the part of Fletcher or his publisher to distance themselves from her. Um, but I, I thought it was a little curious because there are so many other books that are mentioned directly. Um, but, you know, in any event, inside the Chamber of Secrets, uh, Grizz finds a photograph of a young boy, and in the same photo next to the boy um, is a girl, um, whom Grizz assumes to be the boy's sister. Uh, this puts Grizz in mind of himself um, and his own dead sister, Joy. Grizz says that the boy shares his face, but never actually describes either face in very much detail. Um, and this is a very clever way that Fletcher came up with of making this book seem both universal and also incredibly intimate. Um, it allows the boy in the photograph to serve as a surrogate for the audience, no matter who may be reading. Uh, consider the following passage. You want to know how much of an outlier I am? You, in the old picture I have of you, are wearing a shirt with the name of an even older football club on it. You look really happy. In my whole life, I've never met enough people to make up two teams for a game of football. The world is that empty. When Grizz says things like, you look like me, and in the photograph I have of you, you look very happy, he could just as easily be addressing the reader. Occasionally, Grizz will break off from the telling of his own story and sort of ask ironic or rhetorical questions of the boy, um, asking about how things used to be in the world before the gilding, um, questions about the world that belongs to us, the reader, uh, or rather the world to which we belong. Um, in the photograph of the boy and his sister, they are playing on a beach with their dog, and a family, you know, so it's a family outing before the collapse of civilization at the beach, the sandy edge where land and ocean meet. The title of the book is a reference not simply to the adventure of Grizz, but to the photo taken of the boy and his dog at the true end of the world. And that is a really lovely and clever thing. Now, I hate to be a downer, but it's time to get to what I didn't like now. And what I didn't like so much was the book's um, later pacing. Early on, the pacing was fantastic, as I mentioned. Um, just slow enough to flesh things out and let things breathe, but not so slow as to be bogged down with extraneous detail or to inhibit the building of tension. <clears throat> Around the midpoint, though, that all changes. Uh, the book really starts to drag, and it's not that what was occurring was in any way disinteresting to read about, um, but things do sort of get repetitive, all stacked on top of one another. Uh, the most telling point is this scene that I remember where Grizz encounters the ruins of an old casino and decides not to go inside after a long and rich description of its exterior and the surrounding and abandoned city around it. Uh, the reason given in the text for why he chooses not to go inside the casino is that when he was approaching it, um, he detected a foul odor when he approached. 
Um, but my feeling as a reader was that even Fletcher, the author, sensed that things were getting a bit monotonous at this point and decided to remove a part of the story that I bet you anything he actually he, he already had written and originally it was part of the draft and he just pulled it out because he thought it was going on too long. Um, by that point in the story, Grizz had already been to sea, traveled through the wilderness, and wandered an abandoned city without anybody but his dog to interact with. And there's only so much you can do with the constant forays into new and empty locations when you have only one character who has nobody really to talk to. This leads to my next complaint, which is a very mild complaint, really, um, but it was the lack of participation in this story from Grizz's family. Now, they were drugged and unable to participate, so I'm not blaming them or calling them bad or ineffective characters. Um, or saying that they're in any way not proactive. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that um, so much effective time was spent early on fleshing out these characters at the start of the story, and I liked them. Um, and so it's really just kind of a bummer that they weren't able to stick around through any of the actual adventure. Um, now, this was done with a purpose in mind, but I'll get back to that in the spoiler section. Uh, just for now, I found it mildly disappointing. Also, while I loved the book's prose in general, and, and despite the fact that there are very many beautiful moments and passages, on occasion there are points of reflection that seem to be trying just ever so slightly too hard to be insightful, and they ultimately come off as a little unwieldy and silly. Remembering dreams is like picking up small jellyfish. They slip through your fingers, and you never know if it's a dream you had or if you added to the dream in the remembering. Sometimes it's hard to know if you're remembering a dream at all or just a dream about remembering a dream. And if that doesn't make sense, we'll neither do dreams. Uh, okay. And finally, at least to my taste, there were far too many references to what will come to pass or call forward sprinkled um, throughout this narrative. Uh, they don't diminish the progress of the story or reveal things prematurely, um, but they are way too present. Uh, early on, I didn't mind it so much because there were only a few of them, but they became such a consistent feature of the book that things started to take a turn toward the melodramatic very quickly. Um, and the majority of these should have just been removed. That would have fixed the whole problem right there without any rewrites. Just take them out. Okay, folks, I think I've gone as far as I can possibly go without getting into spoilers. So if you'd like, if you feel like you want to try this book out, or if you just want to get my final rating, you can go ahead and click ahead to the following timestamp and I will give a rating that won't include any spoilers. You'll just hear my grading of this book and decide whether it's for you or not. Um, so otherwise, if you have um, any interest in reading this book on your own and wish to avoid spoilers, please click away right now. Okay, so the reason why this book is absolutely impossible for me to talk about without getting into spoiler territory is because toward the end, we're treated not to one, but two major twists that completely changed the game. One of which I saw coming, the other I did not. And in the latter case, it was a massive disappointment not for the twist itself, but for how it was handled. Okay, and I'll get into that very quickly. There are a couple things I need to address first, just so that my discussion of the climax of this book makes sense. So, so number one, there's a character that Grizz encounters throughout um, his journey named John Dark, who's actually a woman. Now, John Dark is like this older lady. Um, she comes from wherever, uh, what remains of France. And accordingly, she speaks French. She doesn't speak English. But she carries around a, um, a little pocket translation, English to French, um, or vice versa, uh, dictionary. And she uses that to communicate as effectively as she can with Grizz, who really only understands the phonetics of what John Dark has to say. And actually, I will say that John Dark has a horse. And um, a lot of reviews I've read of this book talk about how it's like really kind of heart wrenching and there's some there's some some difficult scenes to get through and ones that are very challenging, especially for dog lovers. I would actually say that if you're a horse lover, um, the single like most uh, difficult bit to read, the, the, the most trying bit, the most arduous, the most heartbreaking actually involves not a dog at all, but a horse, at least in my opinion. At some point, John Dark becomes injured. Um, actually, multiple times she's injured, but there's this this 
point where she's really injured and can no longer continue along the journey with Grizz. And so Grizz leaves her behind in sort of like this sort of uh, safe house environment with the understanding that she can go in there and kind of um, just be left to, to die quietly in peace um, and away from the uh, dangers of the world, right? We'll come back to that. So then there's the thief, Brand, who's the one who stole Grizz's dog in the first place. Um, now, Brand um, was encountered by Grizz early on um, in the story. Um, Grizz catches up to him and tries to get his dog back. Um, Brand successfully outmaneuvers um, Grizz and winds up. Brand starts trying to play like these sort of mind games with Grizz, kind of calling into doubt um, the integrity of Grizz's father. Sort of the idea is that like, yeah, uh, I traded your father something so good that he couldn't pass it up. Um, and uh, he gave me your dog out from under you, right? So that's sort of like the head game that he... I'll discuss a little bit more about that later during the questionnaire segment because it does come up. Um, but the point being is that Brand has been the enemy throughout the majority of the book. And then toward the book's climax, Grizz comes to a point where he is captured by a group of people that call themselves the Khans, all right? Now, this is like your sort of classic... Uh, gang of bad guys that exist in like a, a post-apocalyptic setting all right and grizz is thrown into a cell and surprise surprise brand is also there as a fellow captive and so grizz and brand kind of come together and um sort of sort out their differences i don't really need to get into the specifics of that um but the big reveal is that one of the members of the cons is bum -ba -da -ba, joy the sister that uh, Grizz lost years ago when they were both children, right? Now this I saw coming because I didn't tell you this, but early on in the story when Grizz relates the story of Joy, um, he notes that a body was never found. You know, that sort of soap opera logic that if you don't, if there's no body, you know, then the person ain't dead, right? So that's twist number one. Twist number two is that Grizz is a girl. Okay, so the reason why I don't like this is um, because the idea isn't explored at all, right? Um, I actually think that the twist was an interesting one and the way that it was revealed, the way it was handled was highly effective. What's disappointing is that um, nothing is done with this idea. Nothing at all. At the point that it happens, you've got Grizz is imprisoned with the person who has been her enemy and who is a man, right? And they're being held captive by a group of people called the Khans, who are run by a guy named Ellis, who is absolutely the kind of person who any woman he comes across um, to basically to treat them as their sex slave, as a sex slave. All of this um, creates a very tense and interesting situation, and especially because Grizz knows that it's only a matter of time before her secret is going to be revealed because um, she's being, the reason why she's being held in this prison along with Brand is because they're being quarantined by the Khans who are worried that these, that, 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 that these two might be carrying plague, okay? Um, so it's like their standard procedure with new people that they come across. Even if they're going to bring them into the fold of their group, first they need to isolate them and quarantine them. Um, again, a, a pretty uh, commonplace idea in the world now, but it wasn't quite when the book was published. But anyway, back on topic. Th this is a recipe, I would think, for success. It seems like we've got like a really great climax here. But... Um, nothing is done with this idea. And I thought, okay, well, what's the point of it? Is it a commentary on gender identity? Is it a way of exploring Grizz's character? Um, has she always been this way? Does she, does she view herself as a boy? Do, like, what, what, it, what? Was it done just for uh, practical purposes? Is it like an Arya Stark logic uh, from like Game of Thrones where it's safer to travel the open roads looking like a boy rather than a girl? What is this? Well, um, it turns out that uh, at some point in her life, she just cut off her long hair, preferred to wear it shorter, 
And that was pretty much the extent of that. And that when Bran showed up and met the family for the first time, Grizz's father introduced himself and then said, and this is my boy Grizz, right? And the understanding then being that there's a shorthand between father and daughter that I don't trust this man, just roll with it. So the father is the one taking the reins there. Uh, Grizz's character um, doesn't isn't like proactive or quick thinking or this isn't like a plan that she came up with. It's all something that like her father did at the start of this story, just as a means of protecting her identity and, and, and saying, I don't trust this guy as far as I can throw him, right? Again, that's fine. That's, that's fair enough. There's no real problem there. But then what do we do with this? What do we do with this information? Where do we go from here? How does Grizz get herself out of the situation? Well, it turns out she doesn't. She doesn't get herself out of the situation. The whole idea is that she's writing this story down to the boy in the photograph, right? The boy at the end of the world, right? Joy, as it turns out, has been embittered and uh, all throughout these years has been angry at her family for not coming to rescue her. So the point being that when Grizz turns up as a uh, captive of the Khans, uh, Joy is in no mood to help her sister at all. But what she does do is she finds the um, account uh, that Grizz has been writing and reads it up to a certain point, okay? And that's what inspires her to change because all throughout, um, Grizz has been talking about how, uh, about her family, about her dogs, about the way in which she views the world, her sensibilities. It's sort of like um, Joy getting to uh, meet her sister again for the first time and realizing, oh, she really does love me, or oh, they really did try, they just failed, and blah, blah, blah. I like that as an idea. I do. I like that a lot. What I don't like, though, is that Grizz does nothing to get herself out of the prison. Joy handles it. Joy unlocks her. Joy frees her and Brand. And in the meanwhile, completely off page because the whole story is Grizz's POV, Joy poisoned Ellis, the guy who was planning on keeping everybody like in his sex dungeon. So she took care of everything. The degree of agency that Grizz has toward the end of this story is almost non-existent. It's a nice idea showing how the, the, the power of the storytelling um, produced a change in Joy. But Joy is really the one who did everything at the end, and it's Grizz's father who gave him the identity of being a boy, you know, and came up with that whole ruse. So Grizz really is just somebody who went looking for their lost dog, got stuck, and wrote a story. It's a little anticlimactic, and by a little I mean a lot. Now, I really don't want to come across as somebody who just can't be pleased, but I also felt that there were surprisingly few lasting consequences by the story's end. Brand is revealed to be a sort of misunderstood figure who comes from a family of sisters that he cares for very deeply. He makes a pretty amicable truce with Grizz and Joy before parting ways at the end of the book. Ellis ends up taking the place of main bad guy for about the last 5% of the book's page space, and is almost immediately dispatched by Joy off-page. And even on the journey home, as Grizz resolves to stop by John Dark's dying place to give her a proper burial, we find that John Dark is actually still alive, apparently too damn stubborn to die. Oh, and also both of Grizz's dogs make it through the story safe and sound. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but for a book that a lot of readers called heartbreaking in their written reviews, I felt like everyone got off pretty easy by the end of this story. Well, everybody except for John Dark's poor horse. So even though this video's run a little bit longer than I intended it to, I'm still gonna answer that questionnaire that I mentioned way back at the start, because they are very good questions. And like I said, I think it's a great icebreaker. So here we go. Why do you think the author selected the title, A Boy and His Dog at the End of the World? Did the title impact the way you perceived Grizz throughout the story, or cause you to make assumptions? If so, what did you think about the final reveal regarding Grizz's identity? How did it make you feel about yourself as a reader and Grizz as a character? Well, I covered the answer to this earlier. I think the reason he selected the title is obvious. It's a beautifully poignant double entendre, 
and a wonderful framing device for the story being told. Do you think Grizz is a reliable narrator? Does that harm or help the storytelling? The answer to this is yes and no, and probably for obvious reasons. As later revelations make clear, a lot of the things Grizz says, or rather omits, are very telling, and I picked up on several of these. One of the subtler clues is that both of Grizz's siblings have seemingly shortened names, Bar and Ferg. This is a clever way of obscuring the fact that Grizz too is short for something, but without advertising what that means, or what it could mean rather. The most obvious clues that Grizz wasn't being entirely reliable for the majority of the story came in the form of John Dark's letter after the two of them parted ways, in which she called Grizz a liar, but said she understood. At that point in the story, John Dark had helped Grizz and um, had seen her naked, but hadn't commented on it. She understood the truth, even though Grizz had told her she was a boy. The only time I ever felt lied to as a reader was when Grizz talked about Barr's ability to string along the neighboring Lewisman sons, to which it was understood that Barr would marry one, but didn't see any reason why she shouldn't take her time in choosing. The text said that this was because there weren't any other girls for them to marry. Obviously, this was not strictly true, even if Grizz had no interest in any of them. The other area where I thought things were a bit clumsy were Bran's attempts to make Grizz doubt her father. We see Grizz puzzle things out and spend time reflecting on whether the father was actually trustworthy or not, but in retrospect, his plan to pass Grizz off as his son rather than his daughter shows from the very beginning that he never trusted Brand either, so things felt a little muddled on that point. Everything else felt less like a lie and more like a skillful omission on the part of a talented author. The power of stories is an important theme throughout the novel. Discuss the roles, stories, and storytelling play in shaping the characters of both Grizz and Brand. As a follow-up to the prior question, this is a good one, because early on, Grizz makes the remark that one should be careful not to trust a storyteller if their purpose in telling the story isn't clear. Uh, this is said in reference to Brand, who ensnares everyone with his stories, but in retrospect, it is also a subtle clue to the reader that Grizz, who is of course the one telling us a story, might not be reliable. Beyond this, the thematic power of stories is also a strong staple in Grizz's life, and probably the single most relatable thing about her for those of us who do not, or do not yet, live in a post-apocalyptic world. Grizz's decision to go after Brand and Jess is an impetuous one. Do you feel you would have made the same choice? I like to think that I would, but the truth is, she did so without having any way of knowing for sure that her family was going to be okay. She basically left them there reeling from the effects of whatever they'd been drugged with. So I think I would have attempted to go after Brand, for sure, but not without making sure the rest of my family was okay, or going to be okay, at any rate. How does the relationship between Grizz and Brand evolve over the course of the novel? What are the major turning points? How did you feel about where the author left things between them? I liked their relationship as adversaries, with one being more naive and the other more worldly, and I'm okay with the direction it ultimately takes, with that enmity cooling down and an understanding blossoming between them, but it feels rushed, doesn't end up really going anywhere, and there is a hint that they might have actually slept together off page during their time in prison, which came a bit out of nowhere, in my opinion. The novel is rich with descriptions of the wild landscape of Grizz's home and the wider world as it falls into ruin. Is there a particular passage or scene that stood out to you? If so, why? This is actually not something I think is limited simply to the landscape. One of my favorite passages includes the description of Marmalade. He came out with a squat glass jar of something as tawny and red as his hair. I could see it was a jelly, and not some other liquid like the aqua of it. Because as he tilted it, the darker strips of whatever was suspended in it did not move. It reminded me of the single amber bead mum has round her neck. The one with a bit of insect trapped in it. Backlit by the flames in the grate, it looked like someone had reached into the sky and taken a lump out of the setting sun and bottled it. The entire book is filled with language and descriptions like these particularly when employed to characterize such mundane treasures as a jar of jam, Fletcher's use of language is some of the strongest stuff the book has to offer and really underscores how much we often take for granted in the comfort of our daily lives. On the journey, 
All that Grizz encounters triggers questions about what it must have been like to live in a more crowded and technologically advanced world. Did this make you think differently about the things that we take for granted in our present? Something the book doesn't really advertise as much is that it seems to have been written with younger readers in mind. For example, references to C.S. Lewis's Narnia books are done in such a way that the author assumes familiarity with the work on the part of the reader, whereas books like McCarthy's The Road or Miller's Canticle for Leibowitz have their premises explained in the text of the novel, and this makes sense as younger readers are less likely to have encountered those books. So while it's not much of a groundbreaking work for me, I can imagine that if I were younger, I'd probably find it even more thought-provoking than I already do. The book is certainly effective in the questions it poses, and this is strengthened by the framing device, as I've discussed a couple of times already. In some ways, the book is a letter to the present, written to us from someone in the future. If you could write a message for Grizz to find in the emptier future of this book, what would it be? I would simply share with her the sad reality that in some ways the comfort and ease of our lives today, in the most developed parts of the world at least, um, can lead to a lack of connection with nature and to one another. Um, I'm not trying to say that I don't enjoy the entertainment and convenience of the internet or the joys of air conditioning in the hot summer months, for example, but I would tell Grizz that there are moments in my life when I do envy her the world she lives in. The free men tried to find a way to save consciousness by downloading it onto computers. What do you think is more important, survival of humanity or survival of life on the planet? Do you think the two things are mutually achievable or are they in conflict? Um, as far as I'm concerned, questions like these don't really tend to lead anywhere other than down further philosophical and speculative rabbit holes. Uh, so let's leave that business to Morpheus and Neo. If you had been one of the 0.0001% of people who still could have children after the gelding and had decided like Grizz's forebears to go live quietly away from the gaze of the last born generation, where would you choose to go? If you realized you or your kids or grandkids were part of the last born generation, what would you do? Um, I'd just try to get somewhere warm, maybe tropical, some place with good conditions for fruit and veggies to grow and where the winter would be more bearable. I really don't like the idea of going through winter every year without electricity. If you could leave one old record for Grizz and John Dark to find and play on the wind-up gramophone, what would it be and why? The part of the book where Grizz and John Dark play the music on the old gramophone is actually one of my favorite parts of the book. It's so beautiful. I loved it a lot. I actually thought long and hard about this, uh, my answer to this one. Um, there's so much amazing music out there. I don't know how you could narrow it down, but ultimately, it, although it was like tearing off my own arm, I based my decision on the following logic. It's at least conceivable that Grizz could come across books about music theory or also books filled with sheet music. Um, we're also told that her father and, and maybe even her brother um, have some level of skill uh, or musical ability using the fiddle um, or other instruments. So it's perfectly possible that a lot of today's music that's been transcribed could be played by Grizz and her family if they found the instruments, practiced well enough, yada yada. Um, again, the, the stars kind of have to align for that to happen. And while this is much easier said than done, it's nowhere near as out of reach as the idea of Grizz ever getting to listen to a full orchestra. That many people do not exist lumped together anywhere in the known world at any one time um, for Grizz, uh, let alone that many musicians. So I'd probably leave a copy of Beethoven's Ninth or something, just some extraordinary orchestral piece or symphony just so she could listen to one at least once in her life. If the story continued, what do you think would happen next? Well, I'm very sorry that the story ends where and how it does. Um, I think I've made that quite plain, but I also have no desire to see the story continue. Uh, the climax doesn't make effective use of the premise or, of, uh, or the setting that the author spent so much time and energy constructing. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, I would hope that he wouldn't do something quite so hackneyed as bring back Brand and reveal that he got Grizz pregnant, although it does seem like um, there was something alluded to that was off page um, near the end there. Uh, so that's, I guess, what I 
I could expect to happen if the story had continued, but really I just wish that Grizz had had more agency during the climax. That would have tied the whole thing together for me. It really would. And with that, that's the end of the questionnaire. I encourage anybody who reads or has read this book already to leave their answers to these questions in the comments below. Um, I look forward to what any of you might have to say. Okay, time for the final rating. So a lot of the positive reviews that I've read from people about this story um, seem like little more than non-statements to me. I'm talking about like on websites like Goodreads, for example. I mean, when your title for the book is a boy and his dog at the end of the world and you've got reviews saying things like good if you're a dog lover and you like apocalyptic stories um that review is basically a waste of time for the person who read it and a waste of effort by the person who left it while there is a certainly a lot to love about this book the ending is one of the weakest i have read in a long while um it was so anticlimactic that i spent a few solid days wrestling with the question can I give this an honest recommendation? Now, I once heard Stephen King give the following advice in a talk he was giving somewhere. He said, if you wouldn't be willing to read a book a second time, then you probably shouldn't recommend it to others. I think that that's generally a good rule of thumb, even if it does come from the king of good books that have bad endings. Maybe that makes him an expert in what he's talking about here. Who knows? Um... There are parts of this story I really adored, and I am sure I will revisit again in the future. And I love Mr. Fletcher's authorial voice, um, as well as his creativity. I'd certainly like um, to read more from him in the future. It's just that based on how he ended this story, I think his plotting could use some development. Uh, the payoffs he delivered near the end didn't live up to what the earlier brilliance promised, in my frank opinion. With that idea in mind, though, I still find that I can indeed recommend the book, but most especially to one demographic in particular. I would say that if you have any ambitions of becoming a published fiction writer, particularly if you've never written fiction before, this book offers an excellent education. It teaches a lot of great lessons, both when it's working well and while it's falling apart. Why bother, even after all I've told you? Because for all that you can listen to me give my thoughts, it's another thing entirely if you read the book yourself and let things play out in your own mind's eye. Maybe you'll even have a different take on it than I do. But I, my advice is to take what you can from the good, learn all that you can from the bad, and I'd say the pitfalls are worth the price of entry, uh, and definitely a great deal more than that if you end up stepping up your game as a writer as a result. So with that in mind, although I do think that I'm being a bit generous here, my final rating for A Boy and His Dog at the End of the World is 3 stars out of 5. I hope you enjoyed this review. Uh, please consider liking the video, leaving a comment, or subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Um, I hope you'll return next week for when I discuss a work of nonfiction. Uh, the title will be The Meaning of Matthew by Judy Shepard. Uh, for now, thank you for watching, and have a great day. Goodbye, guys.